Greetings. Now, Linval, uh, you began your career way back in the early 1970s. Maybe you can enlighten the good people here at Rototom Sunsplash Reggae University a little bit about how you became involved in music and where and when you first began to record. Yes, well, I did start in New York, New York City. I did start produce my first song in New York. So how is it that you came to be in New York? Because you're a born Jamaican, born and raised in Jamaica. How and when did you go to New York and why? Well, my parents did migrate to New York. So they did take me with them. And I was a young boy getting bad in Jamaica. So that was a good move for me. Okay, so you were hanging out with the wrong crowd and going yeah. down the wrong road. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. so when you came up to New York, where did you settle and what was the experience like for you? Did you come up, were you a teenager or how old were you? Well, I was a teenager, but I was just singing, singing, just keep on singing in like, you know, when I hear those version, I try to sing a new version then. And my friends always say, ah, you sound good, man. You sound good. So I just keep on singing till I meet a guy named Patrick Ali. He used to sing like John Holt. Okay. And I asked him, where could I go to do recording? And he take me to Brooklyn and introduced me to a studio named Artcraft. I never forgot that. And I think I take a little money from my mother. I never forgot that. And I go to the studio and I book the studio and I record one song. And what was the name of the song? The song name, There Is No Other Woman. Okay, so Selector, give us a bit of track one so we can familiarize ourselves with the start of Linval Thompson's career. Yes, so when I hear that track, the, the voice is already quite distinctive. It's definitely a Linval Thompson record. At the same time, maybe we can hear some influences there from other popular singers. Can you explain a little bit about who was influencing you then and how did you develop your singing style? Um, well, I was listening to Dennis Brown. Yes, he was my singer and he's still my singer, you know? And I produce a lot of Dennis Brown's song too. And what did you like particularly about Dennis Brown's style at well, that time? Well, uh, I just like the style, you know what I mean? It just, it just catch me, you know what I mean? Yeah, I like that style, yeah. And what kind of musicians were you working with in that time in New York? Um, the musician, Bonnie Ruggs, used to play with those musicians. The, um, the Buccaneers. Okay, so it was a band of Jamaican expatriates active yes. in New York. Yes. And yes. Bunny Ruggs, who later Bunny, fronted yes. Third World, used to yes, sing with them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So can you remember any particular musicians from the group? 
No, they never really have no, no big name like that, you know? Okay. Yeah. So how many other songs do you remember recording in this first burst of activity in New York? We record the next song named Good Gracious Woman, after, after. Uh, sorry, you say, what was it called? Good Gracious Woman. Good Gracious Woman, yeah. And not... one, a next one named Roll River Jordan. Okay, Roll River Jordan. Well, you could, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that's the same track, but yes, okay. Yes, I think so. Yeah, you River think so? Jordan. Okay, well, give us a little taste of track 16. We'll see if it's the same track you're talking about or if it's Maybe. a little later. Yeah, try it. Yeah, 16. Roll with a dada Roll with a dada If the rich man don't try to help the poor man Blood gonna roll like with a dada Roll with a dada and roll Now, shortly after you recorded these early works in New York, you were back in Jamaica. Yes, well, from the first track, I went back to Jamaica. The first track, I went back to Jamaica. And what happened exactly when you came back to Jamaica? Well, I, I came back with the song, trying to make people, like, different people hear this song. So I take it to, to Randy's, to Randy's record store. That time you have um, Keith Hudson and Stammer. They was there and they listened to it and they invite me that they, they want to do a track with me and they're ready to do a track. And I did do a track named Westbound Plain. Yes, give us a bit of track four and we'll see what else you can tell us about it. Yes. So, yeah, that brings to mind a few questions about this track because, of right. course, right at that same time, Dennis Brown had a monster hit yes. with a track called Westbound Train. Right. So, what's the relation? Yes. Well, this track, it still show you that the reason why I leave Jamaica, my mother say I was in bad company. Okay. And that's why she take me in America. So I remember, and I write the track. Also, still remember Dennis Brown, Westbound Train. Okay. You understand? Yes. Cool? Okay, so it was like an autobiographical track that you put into Dennis's phrasing or something like right, that. Right, correct. And also, you mentioned that you uh, produced that song with 
Keith Hudson and his associate Stama. Stama, correct. Now, Keith Hudson is one of the more enigmatic producers in the history of Jamaican music. Yes. And Stama is kind of virtually unknown. Right. So maybe you can explain to the good people here what was Keith Hudson like to work with as a producer and who exactly was Stama and what contribution did he make? Well, Keith Hudson was the singer and Stama was the man who acted like a rude boy at that time. And you know what I mean? And make sure everything going on good and rough up. If you know, like a rude boy style at that time. So he was like a kind of uh, strong man yes. there with Keith Hudson. Correct, correct, correct. And then Hudson himself, what about his approach to producing and putting this track together? Yes, well, he know the business and he have a root style, a, a sound, you know what I mean? And I think it was a good style, good move. And he, he, he can create his own song, he write his own song, and all of that, you know? Okay. Now, around this same time, on this same first trip back, you start to record a few tracks at the Black Ark, another legendary space in the history of Jamaican music. And you do this both with Lee Scratch Perry himself, as well as another producer who was working there at the time, Phil Pratt. What can you tell me about the tracks you were doing there? What do you remember about that experience? Well, um, when, as I meet Phil Pratt, he listened to the songs, what I'd done before, and he, he liked the style, so he, he introduced me to come to Black Art Studio, that's Lee Perry Studio. And I, and I sing two tracks for him. So let's take a little listen to track five. We'll take a little piece of that and see what you remember about it. A rumba, a rumba, yeah. A rumba, a rumba, a rumba, yeah. A rumba, a rumba, yeah. Girl, you got to run, you got to run. Girl, you got to run, you got to run. Girl, you must run, you got to run. So uh, give us a fade and uh, yes. So yeah, what do you remember about that yes. track? Well, Mr. we Thompson. did record that at um, Black Art Studio. That's Lee Perry Studio. And after that, when Lee Perry heard the song, he introduced me to do recording for him. Okay, so let's take a little listen to a bit of track seven. This is the track you recorded for Lee Scratch Perry at that time. We'll see what you can tell us about it. You will never, never get next to me No matter how you try and you try, my friend Ever, ever try to get next to me I'm gonna show you a little fool Kang Hit them Kang Kang Fu Kick them Kang Kang Fu Fu Kang Fu Kang No matter how they try and they try You will never, never succeed my brain No matter how you try so, Kung Fu, or Kung Fu Man, yes. I guess it's called. So, what was it like working with Lee Scratch Perry himself at that time, and what was the Black Ark Studio like then? Because when you listen to those tracks, it doesn't quite sound to the full stereo... Right 
sound of what he had a yeah. few years later. Yes, well, um, in that time, Scratch have a two-track, two-track machine. We never have no four-track or six-track or 16-track, just two-track. And Scratch doing the harmony. Hoo, ha! So everything go on one track, and the bass on one track, and okay. my voice on one track. So it's two-track. Okay, so it was very limited equipment yes, and yes, basic conditions. Yes, yes. Yes. And a little uh, shortly after these tracks, you make a very important connection with the hit making producer Bunny Striker Lee, and you begin a long standing association with him. What do you remember about how was that connection made, and what was the first track you recorded for him? Well, as everybody here, my son, as a new artist, just coming against a lot of big artists, like you have Carnell Campbell, you have Johnny Clark, you have Dennis Brown, you have um, Delroy Wilson, and many more. I was a newcomer, just coming. So when the producer them hear my style, they are interested. So they invite me to come to the studio. So that's how it starts. Okay, so Bunny Lee said, come on, Linval, come into the studio. Yes. And what was the first track you laid down? Well, the first track is a track named Don't You Cut Off Your Dreadlocks. Okay. It's the first track. Yeah, track number eight, please. Well, technical issues once again. Please bear with us. We're going to try one more time. Otherwise, we'll move on no, to I, another I, track. I can sing it live if you want. Oh, yeah. Go for it. Come in, Mr. Thompson. Wah, wah, ja, ja. Wah, wah, ah, 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 ah. And he played a fool So don't you cut off your dreadlocks Because Judge will chastise you He will hurt you Wicked, wicked, absolutely fantastic So, uh, hearing you sing that song for us it reminds uh, of the many biblical references you often make in your work, and also that track there, 1975, you're already talking about dreadlocks and the Rastafari way of life. So maybe you can speak a little bit about Rastafari in your life and uh, these biblical influences that you draw on in your work. Well, if you remember in that time, I don't hear no artist was singing about dreadlocks. If you remember, nobody was singing about don't you cut off your dreadlocks, let your dreadlocks grow, or about Natty Dread. Maybe only Bob Marley, I think. If you listen back, I remember back. If I'm wrong, let me know. <laughs> okay. Well, so as we were saying before, so that was a monster hit for you yes. that led to your first album, yes. which caused uh, quite a great success, big interest in Britain and uh, onwards to the US and you know elsewhere. But let's take another listen to a track with a similar theme that you also recorded for Mr. Lee. Give us a bit of track 12 and we'll see what you remember about this one. If you don't have a long, long dreadlocks, I'm sorry 
What do you remember about those types of tracks and working with Bonnie Lee? Well, I sing the first version, Don't You Cut Off Your Dreadlocks. So I just come with another version. If you don't have a long, long dreadlocks, I'm sorry for you. And that was the next hit. Okay. Now I understand that once you were working with Bonnie Lee and then you were working for other producers here and around, but you began to... Um, how, can, how can I put this? I guess you, you had been producing your own music from the start. As from, you from, the were, start yes, yes. from the start, yes. So you understood that there was probably more benefit in being your own producer. No, I never really understand that. Thing. It's just the vibes. You know what I mean? It's like um, the creator does say, do that. And I think that's the way. I do, you know, I just do it. Yes. Question. Yes. Uh, Lim, about this Bunny Lim material, uh, where you were voicing the tunes at, at King Tabby, Gramelli Avenue. So can you tell us something about the vibe in the studio? Very little studio, home studio, with very little booth into the, the, the house, King Tabby at the controls. If you don't have your song ready, you're gonna burn up in the studio. <laughs> so you have to be strong and come with something positive. You understand? And you can't stay long because you're gonna burn up. <laughs> so that's the vibes. So you kept it on the spontaneous outlook. Okay, well, um, so a little farther down the line, you began to score some quite big hits with self-produced material. Let's take a little listen of track 18, an absolute anthem, and see what you can tell us about that. That track, that was my um, first track I start to produce in Jamaica for myself. And I make the rhythm at Channel One. And it's so important because Family Man, Family Man play for Bob Marley. That's the only track he ever played for me. No other, just one track. Okay. And that's Don't You Cut Off Your Dreadlocks bass. 
Okay, yeah. And I vice it at King Tobin's. Okay. And it was a, a big hit. Yes, indeed. And uh, yeah, quite an outstanding anthem for uh, the, the... Yes, we also have it in a movie named Eurostar. A, a movie a big, named... Yes, Eurostar. So tell us about this movie. Has it been released yet? Yes, it's been released. Yes, and I collect and all of that from Trojan Record. Okay, so you mean it was used in a movie soundtrack? Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. you say the film was called what? Eurostar? Euro, 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 Eurostar. Eurostar. Yes. Okay, if you go well, online, you will find it. Okay, well, I guess we all got to go and seek that one out. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. I think you make that one miss you. <laughs> yes, you, you make that one miss you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, now at the same time, you began to produce other artists, and you started to have some quite successes with that as well. So let's take a listen to one of your early productions, track 20. This is with the great Cornell Campbell. Yeah, that's not the right track, so... I can't sing that one. <laughs> yeah, okay, I tell you what, let's try track 22 instead. Since, uh, no, 22. Try track 22. So the name of the track, Judgment Time, and the name of the group? Mystic Eyes. So what can you tell us about that group? Ah, these guys, these three guys living in the ghetto, never sing before, but they always playing their guitar. And they come to me, say they want to sing. So when they sing, I like the song. So I say, okay, let's do our album. And we record an album, and that's the only one album they ever record in their life, no more. And I can't find the group no more neither. Right. Well, I think um, Anthony Johnson, who later went solo and had some hits in the early dancehall phase, moved to London, and he's still there. The yes. other two members... I think they, 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 they live in Canada, I think. Okay. I tried to find them, but I can't find them. Okay, so... How did you find it um, shifting into the producer's chair, so to speak, in terms of working with other artists at that time? Because obviously producing your own material with yourself mm -hmm. is one experience. Yes. But producing other, especially unknown artists yes. who'd never recorded before. Yes. Yeah, so yes. what can you tell us about that transition? Why, it, it, it was hard, but I, I just love to help the youngster. That was the vibe that I have. Because there was many little singer want to sing, want to sing. And they come to me every day. Early 16, I record him. I was the first, I think, or the second recording early 16, right? And it come back to, we record Ica Mouse. All those artists, is a big star now. Freddie McGregor, he never hit before. And the first time he sing for me, he have a big hit, big ship sail in the ocean. Yes, indeed. Now, before we move up to that phase, I got a few other questions for you about this late 70s, yeah, early 80s. So the next track we want to 
give a little listen to track 23, and this is one of the first tracks, if I'm not mistaken, to actually credit the Roots Radix band. So give us a little taste and let's see. <laughs> Yes, Six Babylon. What do you remember about that one, Linvor? Well, it was a big song, right, Six Babylon. And I think Roots Radix at that time, they never have no name. And from I started to record them, it's a big name. Everybody talking about Roots Radix. I remember that. Yes, and then at the same time that you were helping to raise them to prominence through your work with them. You also return the favor, so to speak. Give us a little taste of track 28, and we'll see what you can tell us about this one. Yes. So the track is called Lump Sum. And do you remember uh, recording that track, Linval? Who did you do it for and how did it come about? Yes. All right. First, I recorded it for the Roots Radic Band. Right? Second, Lump Sum is like everybody was coming to you. They want something. So that means Lump Sum. They want something. Right? And I say that nobody never remember when I was hungry. Nobody never remember when I was starving. And those things are real. So everybody just coming now. They want lump sum. They want something. So that's how everything really happened. Okay, so got a few minutes left, a few more tracks to run through before we open things up for a question and answer. Mm -hmm. So, um, Next track, I want to give you a taste of, if you give us a little bit of track 29, since you were mentioning Dennis Brown being your singer. And again, this is a returning the favor scenario. So let's see what you can tell us about this.
That's all. Okay, so the track is called, well, I've seen two titles, Call Me on 7-inch or Don't Be Afraid, I think, on 12-inch. Mm -hmm. And you recorded it for? Well, I recorded it for myself, but the track was made by Dennis Brown, the rhythm. Uh, we was trying to work together to make the Thompson Sound. He wanted to be on the Thompson Sound. Uh, at that time, the Thompson Sound was fire, fire in London. Right? So Dennis Brown wasn't so hot at that time. So we come together, we put trucks on Dennis Brown truck, I vice on Dennis Brown truck, and Dennis Brown vice on my truck. Okay, yes? so you were doing like a bartering. Right, right, right. The vice, right. Okay. So you maintain that connection right the way through, more or less, with yes, Dennis? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so you mentioned before you started to have some quite big hits with Ika Mouse, with Freddie McGregor. And another track I want you to give us a little touch, track 31, another massive hit for you as a producer. See what you can tell us about this one. So that track was by the Viceroys, and you did a spectacular album with them, of which that was the title track. What can you tell me about working with them at that time? They were a veteran group that maybe, similar to Dennis, were not quite at the peak at that time. Yes, well, um, when I know them, there was Vice in, there was doing tracks for Cox and Record. And I like the sound, so, they come and meet me, they want to, to do some vicing. So I vice two albums with them and I give it to Trojan Record in London. And it was a big hit. Yeah. Check, check. I have a question. Uh, in this time, like uh, late 70s, early 80s, there was a shift into the music from the rocker style to something slower, like the, the dancehall style, I would say, the rubber dub. And you were producing and singing a lot, so I, I think in some way you, you were instrumental in this. So can, can, can you tell us how this happened? Like, you did start to use Roots Radix, that it became the leading group in the early 80s, playing that, that style, the rubber dub. So y you were instrumental in this shift. Oh, you're talking about dub? Dub no. style? The, the, the slower way to play Dancer. reggae music, yeah man, yeah, rubber dub. Well, I'll tell you the truth. Um, first, I used to record with Sly and Robbie. I used to make tracks with them first. So I was in a problem because Sly and Robbie never liked when I use Roots Radix. So I was in a, a problem. I'm paying them, you know, it's not like they are doing it free but everybody want to record for me, right? So, but Roots Radix have that root song. That when, I in, when I'm in London, I notice everybody love that style. So we try to hold on to the style with Roots Radix. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things. Okay, well, so since you're talking about holding on to that style with the Roots Radix, give us a little taste of track 34 which is again a very distinctive sound from that time and see what you can tell us about it. 
Yes, please. So, who was the song by, Linval, and how did you come to be working with him? That's Freddie Mackey, late Freddie Mackey. Well, um, I like his style, and I like his song, but at that time, many people never really interested in him. But I did like, his, like the song, so I recorded a album with him. Okay, and was the album released? Straight when you recorded it? Or no, was... we never released it till almost years. We just released it a couple, couple of years now, maybe in the right. last three, four years. Right. Was there any particular reason for that? Or? No, it was really. But in London at that time, no company ever interested in Freddie okay. Mackey. Okay. Tell you the truth. I hear you. Yes. Now, uh, we've got all kinds of other tracks we could hit you with, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to play the last two tracks to bring us a bit more up to date, just to remind us of your great versatility. And uh, when the other panelists put their question, then we'll go to question and answer. So give us a bit of track 35. Uh, this is Linval Thompson in a different style. Yes. And the song is called, do you remember? Yes, I remember it. I think the name Backstabber. Well, I think it came out as Labba Mouth. Labba but Mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you remember who you recorded it for? Yes, we recorded it um, for some producer, some new producer. Okay, so I, I think it's credited to George Pang? A joint, like powerhouse yes, label? Yes, yes, he was a new producer at that time, working with Sly and Rabbit. Okay. Yes, correct. So, what was it like for you uh, moving into the digital, quote-unquote, era, the synthesizer-led dancehall phase? Well, I think Jamis was the one who take it over at that time. But what about for you as a singer? How did you adapt to the style? No, I never really too like it, to tell you the truth. Okay. Yeah, I never really like it. No. Okay, well, um, so I'm going to open the platform for my colleagues down at the Rhythm Magazine um, end of the table. Yeah, um, as we just heard, you were like one of the pioneers of dancehall music. Um, first question is, were you aware that you were creating a new genre that would last for the next, how long is that now, uh, 40 years? Mm -hmm. Like, did you really plan or think, okay, we have to come up with something new and this is like a whole new thing for Jamaican music? What you said, if I'm going to do that? Yeah, if, if, no, the, if you, back then, if you were really aware that this is the start of, yes. of a new, new era that lasts, yes, yes, that's yes. still going on now. Yes, that's why I come to Europe to study. Right now I'm studying. I'm studying the younger people right now, what they like and what they are interested in. That's what I'm doing right now. 
Okay, and so my I'm trying to work with their style right now. Mix oh. it with my style and their style. All right, and as a pioneer of dancehall, what do you think of the current state of dancehall? Do you follow what's happening in Jamaican music? No, and I don't really like all. But you, you can fight against it. If you don't like it, you just stay far from it. So I don't fight against things. You know what I mean? It's cause you see, everybody have a different vibes and all of that. But roots music, I know that's the right way right now. Positive music. You know what I mean? Um, and you yourself mentioned earlier, um, you were asking about dub. Um, a lot of your productions have been used for, to put out on dub albums, on Greensleeves especially, yes. um, published quite a few. And they were re-released yes. not too long ago. Yes. And before, I think the name was Scientist Presents Dub Lending or whatever. Now they carry your name. Maybe you can enlighten us how, how that came about. Well, you see, scientists, he don't remember. I don't think he remember everything. Right? Without a Linval or my friend, what name, John Jolaz. Is, is, is not here now. There wouldn't be no scientists. Our Bonnelly. Well, and since you mentioned Junjo, because from what I understand, you were instrumental in helping Junjo to become a producer. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the connection between the two of you and how he came to start to produce? Well, Junjo was like, he was traveling along with me as a, a protector, I would say that. Like a bodyguard. Like a bodyguard, I tell you the truth. And I did glad for it, because in that time, when he was going to Tobies, you have to be hiding, you have to be, the gunman is firing shot, and you have to be moving fast. When you're going to Channel One, it's the same thing. When you're going this afternoon, you can't come out back till the next morning. If you come out back, the gunman may kill you, and that's true, right? So you always need somebody who maybe can defend you some of the time. The police can't help you, see? So it was rough in that time. Okay, so you had him there as a bodyguard, and then And you... then he, he watched me what I'm doing, and I said, all right, I'm gonna give you a truck, and I give him a, a tape, like with some trucks, and that's the time he found Barrington Levy. Okay. Yes. And then, of course, he had an incredible yes. uh, string of hits, yes, yes. with Barrington. Yes. yes. So, uh, just before we switch to the question and answer, just a little bit of this uh, last track to play, just to remind, since uh, Linval, you're going to be performing live this evening, 2.15 uh, a.m. on the Lions stage, and you'll be performing backed by Roberto Sanchez and the Strong Like Samson Band. So I want to play a bit of a track recorded earlier this year, I believe, track 36, and the song is called Borderline. So what can you tell us about that track and working with Roberto Sanchez? Yes. 
Well, this track is something happened. Me and Roberto Sanchez, we was, we was on tour about a couple of years ago. And each time we enter the border, here comes the sheriff. He asks me for my passport. He asks me for my identification. So I have to show them. So I write the song. And that was a good song. Yes. <laughs> OK. OK, so uh, now is the time when uh, we put the platform over to you. The audience, so who would like to put the first question to our special guest, Linval Thomas? Okay, question at the back. Uh, Mike. Hi. Okay, thank you for coming and sharing with us your love. My first question is, um, for you, what does it mean to be a raster? What we need to be a raster? And how you see our new generation our new Rasta's generation, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, right now, when you, to be a Rasta, you don't have to, you have to, in your heart, you have to have love for each and every one. That's the first thing. And you have to stay positive. And you have to try to help people. You know what I mean? And you have to make sure you read your Bible and you know the truths about the scripture. You know what I mean? That's the way I think. You know what I mean? See? Okay, thank you. Okay, and who, oh yeah. Uh, hello. Yes, greetings. I represent uh, Russian media, Daily Vibes. Yes. Um, I have a question because one of my uh, first songs of you were Kung Fu Man. Yes. <laughs> and I was wondering if you did really practice some kind of a Kung Fu or maybe you have a, another hobbies in your life. No, we never practice. He's on the Lee Perry. He's the one who said, Linval, do this. And he really helped me out and he do that. Just like that at the studio. Maybe some other other hobbies in your life. No, we never. That you want to? We never before. No, <laughs> no hobby. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, another question in the front. Greetings, and uh, I thank you for your for your story. Greetings. And uh, I was a bit late, so I missed a part of yes. what she was telling about. Yes. But I heard you say that your mother took you to America uh, because she was with bad company. Yes, yes. Who was the bad company that your mother said she was with? Well, because my... if I listen to your story, I don't see anything bad into it. <laughs> come again, come again. When I listen to your story, yes. What you achieve in life? Yes. I don't see anything bad in it. So who was the bad company All right. that your mother took you away from? The bad company is what? When I was in Jamaica, I hang out with my friends, those guys doing bad things. That's okay. the problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're doing bad things. I wasn't doing the bad things, but it was my friends. You understand? Yeah. And I have one other question. As a producer, Yes. You know, I listened to many of your tracks yes. from, from years ago. Yes. And what I discovered listening to the music is that the music always sounds different, but still the same. What is the, what is the, the technique of that? Okay. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Well, the technique, I try to stay positive. Right? And I know what the people them want. I know what they love. Right? So I try to do stay under on that style. I don't try to change the style. You understand? Because right now I'm making new tracks. I'm producing new things. And you, you soon hear them. You're gonna hear them. It's coming out any minute now. Great thanks. 
Bless of our lives. Bless Thank you. So, um, as the drums are getting closer, I think we've got time for one last question. So, who would like to put the last question to our special guest, Limval Thompson? Oh, oh okay, we've got two, two last questions, yeah. Or maybe three. <laughs> no, two, I think. Yeah, maybe two. Four. <laughs> I never know. Hello, uh, if thanks for coming. Rest. I, I want to know if you have discovered some new inspiration in your work that you are doing nowadays. What have you discovered new, different from before? Yes. If you discover. Yes. Right now, I'm working with about three female artists. Three. Right? Because I discovered that it's a different vibes. Uh, the people need a difference, right? So we have them coming out anytime now. Three female artists. And yes. uh, would you care to share with us the name of the artists? Yes. One of the name, she's, her name is Nadia Makinoff. That's Winston Makinoff data. Nice. And the next one is K Vibes. And the next one is a secret. <laughs> okay, we'll watch this space. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think we had uh, another couple of questions in the house. We got one in the front here. Okay, last question apparently. Yes, Limba, uh, can Bless. you tell me a little bit when you work with Earl China Smith that you did in at the yard? Yes. <laughs> yes, um, we did work with Tina Smith in the yard a couple of years ago. Um, but it was a good vibe for me to be versatile, you know. So right now I'm staying with the Thompson Sound style. Me and Roberto Sanchez, we are working together right now in Spain. Different vibes. Right. Oh. Okay, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So just to remind that tomorrow, right here in the Reggae University tent, at 4 p.m., there will be a screening of the film Rude Boy, looking at the story of Trojan Records. And directly after, at 5.30 p.m., right here, we will have a session entitled Tighten Up, the story of Trojan Records, with Lawrence Kane Honeyset, who wrote uh, a book about Trojan Records, as well as the selector Gladdy Wax. And then, directly after, at 7 p.m., our session, Take Me to Jamaica, The Never-Ending Story of the Jolly Boys. We will be here with the Jamaican mental band, the Jolly Boys. So don't miss it. Be here. But right about now, put your hands together one more time for our special guest, Linval Thompson. Respect. Give thanks.